All right, so lab one, we're starting with the bones of the shoulder girdle. And you notice the title up there is osteology. Osteo means bone. Ology, as you know, means the study of. So the first lab in each section is always going to be a study of bones. So specifically, we're looking at uh, the landmarks on each bone, which are features that are important because there's a ligament that inserts there or a muscle that inserts there or originates there or because it interacts with another bone or something of that nature. So in terms of the bones of the shoulder girdle, the first one is the clavicle, which is the bone that you see here, also known more colloquially as your collarbone. And then the second is the scapula, which is this one, again known more colloquially as your shoulder blade. And then the last one is the humerus. So we've got three bones of the shoulder girdle then, the clavicle, aka your collarbone, the scapula, also known as your shoulder blade, and then the humerus, which is your upper arm bone. So hopefully you've got the lab one sheet in front of you, and you'll notice that there are three columns. There's the one that actually has the landmark on the far left, there's one that says number, and then the last one on the far right is the significance. The number is for the key bones. In the lab there will actually be um, bones with numbers written on them that are on the landmarks, and so you can use those as a study guide. So if you want to bring this sheet to class and actually go through the key bones and write down the numbers, that's where you would do that. And the significance is really what makes that landmark memorable to you. Um, and then for the significance of some of them, um, they have a fairly obvious significance, so I'll mention that as well. But for the most part, the little significance column is for whatever makes that landmark memorable for you. You'll notice that for the pictures I'm using from the Essential Anatomy app. So this is, uh, once you've downloaded that, this is what it'll look like. And obviously um, you can zoom in and out and add layers of muscle and all that stuff but I just have the uh, skeleton at this point, and all of these are screen captures, so it's not uh, using the actual app uh, in this particular slideshow. But nonetheless, um, so you see what we've got is a, an anterior view, anterior meaning front, view of his right shoulder. So one of the things that tends to throw people off um, if you're talking about right and left um, in a patient, for example, is you always talk about their right or their left, because obviously when you're looking at this picture, it's on your left side, um, but it is the patient's or the skeleton's, in this case, is right shoulder. So everything that we're going to be looking at today is all going to be on the right side. So in terms of the landmarks of the clavicle, you'll see that there are two ends to the clavicle. So there's the sternal end and the acromial end. So one of the things you're probably already aware of is that this big bone in the middle of your chest that is your sternum. It's got three parts to it, and we'll talk about those actually near the end of the class. So the sternal end of the clavicle then is the end of the clavicle that articulates with the sternum. And so one of the things that you'll notice when you actually physically hold the clavicle in the lab is that the sternal end is much rounder than the acromial end. So the sternal end is nice and big and round and knobby, and you can see that in this view as well. And then the acromial end is fairly flat. So when you're holding the physical bone in front of you, just know that the rounder of the two ends, the one over here, that is going to be the sternal end. And then the flatter of the two ends, over here, that is the acromial end. So I mentioned that this is the sternal end because it's near the sternum. So then why is this the acromial end? The reason this one's called the acromial end is because this tip of your shoulder, the most lateral tip of your shoulder over here, that's called the acromion. So that's actually part of the scapula. And so this is the acromial end of the clavicle because it articulates with the acromion of the scapula. So again, the acromial end is the flatter end of the two. And then the last landmark for the clavicle is going to be the conoid tubercle. So the conoid tubercle is actually on the posterior aspect, and posterior means back of the clavicle. It's also on the inferior surface, which means below. So the inferior surface is, is essentially the bottom side of the clavicle. So if we look at our skeleton, again we're staying with the right side, but we're looking at him from the posterior views, so we're looking at him from the back, you'll notice this little knob right here. So that's the conoid tubercle. So the significance of the conoid tubercle is that you've got a ligament that inserts there called the coracoclavicular ligament, and the coracoclavicular ligament runs from part of the scapula, which is this little thing, the coracoid, kind of like a bird beak, 
So the coracoclavicular ligament runs from the coracoid to the clavicle, and it holds those two bones together. So it's one of the ligaments that's injured if you separate your shoulder. Um, so the coracoclavicular ligament inserts there at the conoid tubercle, and that's the significance. So the only other thing you'd need to know about the clavicle other than those three landmarks is whether the clavicle is on the right side or on the left side. Obviously in this skeleton that's fully articulated, it's pretty easy to tell left and right. If you just have an individual clavicle, things get a little tougher. So the way that I would do it is that you know that the rounded end is the sternal end that goes near the sternum. So make the rounded end close to your midline when you're physically holding the clavicle. And then again, the other thing that you know is that the conoid tubercle, this really obvious little bump, has to face down, so inferiorly, and toward the back, which is posteriorly. So if you have the external end near your sternum and then take the conoid tubercle and make it face down and back, if you've aligned it like that, that should tell you whether or not you have a right or a left clavicle. And we'll go over how to actually do that in lab as well. So those are three landmarks for the clavicle. Next up is the scapula. So again, we're sticking with the right shoulder girdle. And so what you've got here is a posterior view of the right shoulder. So again, posterior meaning back. So in terms of the landmarks of the scapula, we're actually though gonna switch from our posterior view to our anterior view. So we're gonna switch to the front. So again, now I've just zoomed in a little bit, but you're looking at the right shoulder uh, from the front. So the first landmark on there is the coracoid process. And I mentioned a second ago when talking about the coracoclavicular ligament that the coracoid process is this little bird beak looking projection here. Uh, it's pretty obvious in most people. I'll show you how to find it in class on yourself if you're interested. Um, but it is this obvious little bird beak kind of projection here. The significance of the coracoid process is that there are two muscles that originate there. So biceps brachii, one of your big elbow flexors, uh, its short head originates there on the coracoid process. And then you've also got another muscle called coracobrachialis, which is a uh, glenohumeral or shoulder flexor that originates there as well. So two muscles originate there, biceps brachii and coracobrachialis. One muscle inserts there, which is pectoralis minor. So pec minor uh, is actually deep to pec major, which is one that you might be familiar with. So pec major is your big superficial, which means close to the skin surface, your big superficial chest muscle. Uh, that's the one that you use when you do things like uh, push-ups and bench press and all of that. Uh, and pectoralis minor is deep to that or underneath that, and it inserts there at the coracoid process. So that's the significance of the coracoid process. Um, and then obviously the coracoclavicular ligament originates there as well. So there's a lot going on at that little bony projection. The next thing is the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. So the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa is this thing that my arrow is pointing to. It's the socket for your shoulder, right? Because the primary joint of your shoulder is called the glenohumeral joint. It's the interaction between this glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa and the humeral head, which is this rounded part of the humerus right here. So that makes it then the glenohumeral joint because you've got the socket and the ball. So the glenoid cavity then is this little indentation there. Next thing, so now I've got to flip around to the back side of the scapula. So again, now we're looking at the posterior view of the right shoulder. So the next thing is the superior angle of the scapula. So in terms of terminology, anything that is superior means that it's higher up. So think about product quality, right? If you've got a superior product, you've got a product that is of higher quality, it's better. So it's closer to the top in the rankings. So in an anatomical sense then, something that is superior is closer to the head, it's higher up. So the superior angle of the scapula then is up here. It's this topmost angle of the scapula. So you can see it right there. I'm going over it with the mouse. So there's the superior angle. The significance of the superior angle is there's a muscle called levator scapulae, which is one of the muscles that uh, raises your scapula. So whenever you shrug your shoulders, one of the muscles that's involved in that, uh, which is levator scapulae, inserts there. And it actually kind of inserts along this line right there. So then the next thing is the superior border. So if we keep going laterally, laterally meaning away from the midline, then you've got the superior border right here. Not a lot going on with the superior border, but that's where it is. It's the smallest of the borders. It's right there. Then the next thing is the medial border. So if we're talking about uh, medial in terms of directions, medial means close to the midline. So in this case, you can think of it being close to the spine. So you've got your vertebral column, your spine right here. And so the medial border then is closest to the midline or closest to the spine. 
So the medial border is all of this side of the scapula. That's the closest to the spine. And it's an important site of insertion for uh, two scapular retractors, so two muscles that bring your shoulder blades back. So think about if you uh, have good posture and you bring your shoulder blades back, two of the muscles that do that are your rhomboids. So there's rhomboid minor and rhomboid major. Minor is on top, so it's more superior. Major is below that, so it's more inferior. Um, and so both rhomboid minor and rhomboid major insert there along the medial border of the scapula. Then we'll go from the medial border, we're actually going to flip back around to the front side. So if we flip around to the front side of the scapula, you'll see that the scapula is kind of uh, concave on the front. So it's, it's sort of caved in uh, on the front side or on the anterior aspect of the bone. So then all of this concave surface on the anterior aspect, again on the front, that is the site of origin of the subscapularis muscle. So that's your subscapular fossa. So again, subscapularis, which is one of your four rotator cuff muscles of the shoulder, that muscle originates there in the subscapular fossa, which again is all of this anterior aspect. Next thing, back to the back, we've got our lateral border. So in terms of the lateral border of the scapula, if this is our medial border, then our lateral border, again lateral meaning away from the midline, lateral border is all of this. So there's your lateral border, uh, also a site of muscle origin. So in particular the muscle that originates there on the lateral border is a muscle called teres minor, which is also one of the four rotator cuff muscles. So teres minor kind of originates in through here, sort of in that middle uh, third, if you will, of the lateral border. Next thing is the inferior angle. So if we said that superior is higher up, it's closer to the top. Inferior then is obviously farther down, it's away from the top, it's closer to the bottom. And so then the inferior angle of the scapula is this little angle down here. So that's actually a pretty important landmark whenever um, somebody has shoulder pain. It's one of the things that you'll look at clinically is uh, you'll try to assess how their scapula moves because if their scapula doesn't move correctly, um, then they can have problems where their uh, humerus, which I'm trying to hear the mouse, where their humerus will actually kind of bump up against the acromion, the tip of the shoulder out here. And so then that can cause pain, that can cause a bursitis, uh, tearing of one of the rotator cuff muscles called supraspinatus in that case. So um, if the scapula doesn't move correctly, if it doesn't, uh, it's not able to rotate up and out, then that's one of the things that can cause shoulder pain. So to assess that, what we'll do clinically is we'll actually look at that inferior angle of the scapula and make sure that it is moving up and out when somebody raises their arms over their head. It's also a site of muscle origin. So there's another muscle, really similar sounding to the last one, which is teres major, that originates there from the inferior angle. It's kind of a combination of the inferior angle and lateral border, but the origin of teres major is, is right over here. So that's our inferior angle. And then the next thing is the supraspinous fossa. And that actually goes together really closely with the spine of the scapula. The spine of the scapula is one of the more obvious landmarks on the scapula. So again, sticking with this posterior view, if you look at this really obvious bony ridge, and pretty much all of us, it's really easy to feel along your upper back. You can feel that pretty obvious bony ridge. So again, that's the spine of the scapula. So I know I skipped one because, so it makes it make more sense um, if we work backwards one. So the supraspinous fossa, so a couple things going on there. So supra means the same thing as superior. So supraspinous means above the spine. So we know then that the supraspinous fossa has to be up here. And then a fossa is an indentation. So you're looking for an indentation that is above the spine of the scapula, so it's closer to the head. Um, and so to get that one, we kind of have to do this three-quarter view over here. And so you can see the indentation there. All of that is the supraspinous fossa. One of the four rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, originates in there. It's the more, most commonly injured of the rotator cuff muscles. And its tendon actually runs uh, here, underneath the acromion, again, that being the tip of your shoulder. So the tendon of supraspinatus runs up under there. And so again, if you've got problems where maybe your shoulder joint, which is called the glenohumeral joint, maybe that's too loose, then that can allow your humeral head to move up a little bit and start to wear down or fray that muscle. And so if somebody has a rotator cuff tear, 
That's the most commonly torn of the rotator cuff muscles, the supraspinatus, that again originates here in the supraspinous fossa. Then we've got our infraspinous fossa. So if supraspinous means above the spine, then infraspinous sounds a lot like inferior, and we know that inferior means below. So the infraspinous fossa is an indentation just below the spine of the scapula. So the infraspinous fossa is pretty big. It's actually all of this area here. So that's your infraspinous fossa. And again, uh, the last of our rotator cuff muscles, the only one we haven't talked about yet, which is called infraspinatus in this case, originates there from the infraspinous fossa. And then the last landmark one is one we've already talked about a few times, which is right there. That's our acromion. So again, the acromion is the tip of your shoulder, and so it is this flat landmark out here. So those are all the landmarks for the scapula. And then we'll move on to the humerus. So in the case of the humerus, again, that is your upper arm bone. Uh, and so in terms of uh, landmarks in the humerus, there aren't a ton because we're actually going to stop kind of halfway down the humerus. So we're just going to do the ones that deal with the shoulder. So the first landmark on the humerus is the head. And so you can see the head is this big rounded part there. So all of that then is the head of the humerus. One of the things you might have noticed on the different anatomical views is that uh, the ends of the bones tend to have a little bit different color and they tend to look a little bit smoother. So you can see that with the head of the humerus here that it's kind of a, a lighter tan than the rest of the bone and it looks a little bit smoother than the rest of the bone. That's because the ends of the long bones are covered in cartilage called hyaline cartilage. And so hyaline cartilage is this really uh, smooth Teflon-like cartilage that does a few things, really two things. It allows the bones to slide on each other nice and smoothly, so to keep them from dragging to minimize friction, but it also serves uh, to cushion for impact. So for example, in the case of your thigh, your thigh bone is called your femur, and the head of the femur looks somewhat similar to the head of the humerus, and it has fairly thick hyaline cartilage to absorb the impact between your femur, your thigh bone, and your pelvis. So that's the head of the humerus, and you can see so all of that is covered in that hyaline cartilage. And where that cartilage ends is going to be pretty obvious on the bones when you see them in, in the lab. But where that cartilage ends is our next landmark, which is the anatomical neck. So it's this line that's about 45 degrees right there. That's the anatomical neck of the humerus. So that's your next landmark. Not a lot of significance there. The bone changes shape um, before you reach skeletal maturity, so before you quit growing, there is a growth plate near there. Um, but really for us, there's not a whole lot important going on there. So that's the anatomical neck. And then the next thing, so there's two tubercles. So tubercles are, are projections from the bone. Um, so there's a, a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle. There's another term that we'll talk about later, which is a tuberosity, which is the same kind of a thing. It's also a projection, uh, but it is larger than a tubercle. And so, again, we're talking about projections, but relatively small ones uh, in the scheme of the body. So we've got two tubercles there, a greater and a lesser. So the greater tubercle is actually the more lateral of the two. So the greater tubercle is out here. So it's all of this out here on the lateral aspect of the bone. And the greater tubercle is going to be important because three of your four rotator cuff muscles insert there. So the muscles that insert there include supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. We're all going to insert somewhere there along the greater tubercle. And then you'll see another little bony knob right there that I'm circling with the mouse. So that little bony knob there, obviously, is the lesser tubercle. So the last of the rotator cuff muscles, which is subscapularis, inserts there in the lesser tubercle. And then between them, so now you're going to flip to the back side of the paper. Um, I'm actually going to skip the surgical neck, we'll come back. Um, between those two tubercles, between the greater and the lesser tubercle, is the intertubercular groove. So intertubercular means between the tubercles. Um, obviously a groove is a little valley. And so the intertubercular groove is this little space between the greater and the lesser tubercles. It's also known as the bicipital groove, which may be easier for you to remember. That's usually how I refer to it. And the reason it's called that is that the long head of your biceps runs through that little groove because the long head of the biceps actually originates from the top of the glenoid up here and that tendon runs underneath the acromion 
runs between the greater and lesser tubercles, and then you've got a little ligament that keeps it attached to the bone, and then it uh, gives rise to the belly of the muscle right about there. So anyway, the intertubercular bicipital groove, the long head of biceps, sits in there. And then the one that I skipped was the surgical neck. So the surgical neck is this area right here where the bone narrows a little bit just inferior to or just below the greater and lesser tubercles. So the surgical neck is kind of this area right in here. And our last landmark is the deltoid tuberosity. So I mentioned tuberosities. So this is a fairly large landmark um, on the lateral aspect or on the outside, or again, away from the midline aspect of the bone. So the deltoid tuberosity is about halfway down and it's fairly distinct on the plastic bones, but it's not very distinct on the essential anatomy pictures. So the deltoid tuberosity is about there so again, about halfway down, what you're looking for on the, the bones in class is a flat spot on the lateral aspect of the humerus, about halfway down the arm. So again, it's right in about here is where you're going to find the deltoid tuberosity. That's the site of insertion of the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle is the big superficial shoulder muscle that most of us are familiar with that kind of forms the cap of the shoulder. All right, and then the last three things that we're going to talk about on this slideshow are the three joints of the shoulder girdle. So joints are typically named for the bones or the parts of the bones that they connect because if, if you've got a joint, you have the interaction of at least two bones. So the three joints then, again, we're, going, we're flipping our view to go back to the anterior view of the right shoulder girdle. So the first joint that I've got listed on there is the acromioclavicular joint. So again, the acromioclavicular joint, you, can, you know from the name where it is. Uh, remember that the tip of the shoulder out here is the acromion, and then you know that this bone is the clavicle, so the acromioclavicular joint is the interaction between those two, and you can see the little joint space there. The only reason you probably would have ever heard of the acromioclavicular joint, the AC joint for short, is if somebody separates their shoulder. So if you get a shoulder separation, usually it comes from falling on an outstretched hand, like you fall and try to catch yourself. And so um, what that can do is cause a little separation there, and if it's significant enough, or if the injury is severe enough, then the lateral end of their clavicle out here, the acromial end, will pop up because you've damaged the joint capsule over here. So that's your acromioclavicular joint. In terms of um, motions that happen there, really what ends up happening is as you lift your arm up and out, which is called abduction, so if you lift your arm away from your side, what ends up happening is that your scapula has to rotate upward. And what that means is that this inferior angle of the scapula here rotates up and out. And so when that happens, when you get scapular rotation, you get some rolling and sliding here at the AC joint or the acromioclavicular joint. So that's the AC joint. The other one, or the next one, is the sternoclavicular joint, which is right here. So again, that bone in the middle of your chest is your sternum. And then this is the sternal end of the clavicle. So the sternoclavicular joint is that interaction between the sternum and the clavicle. It's the only true bone-to-bone -bone connection between your arm and your axial skeleton, which means uh, the central portion of your skeleton. So it includes the uh, skull, the vertebral column, also known as your spine, uh, your rib cage, and your pelvis. So that's the axial skeleton. So the only true bone-to-bone -bone connection between your arm and the axial skeleton is right there at the sternoclavicular joint. It's pretty similar to the AC joint in a lot of ways in that uh, you get essentially some uh, sliding and rolling at that joint. So for example, if you again raise your arm out from your side, you'll get uh, a little bit of a medial roll. Um, so it'll kind of roll toward the midline a little bit as you do that. And then it can also, you'll see some uh, sliding as you, if you round your shoulders and have bad posture, it'll kind of rotate anteriorly a little bit. And I'll show you what that looks like in class. And then it'll also rotate posteriorly if you uh, retract your scapulars or bring them back together. So that's the sternoclavicular clavicular joint. And then the last one that we'll spend most of our time talking about is over here. I already mentioned this one, which is the glenohumeral joint. So if somebody says something about their shoulder hurts, usually what they're talking about is the glenohumeral joint. So the glenohumeral joint, again, is the interaction between the glenoid cavity, which is part of the scapula here. It's that um, the socket or the cup into which the head of the humerus fits. So again, it's the glenohumeral joint because it's the interaction between the glenoid cavity and the humeral head. All the rest of that sheet in terms of the actions and the plane and axis 
between the glenohumeral and scapulothoracic articulations. We'll cover those actually during lab. I should say though, the last thing on there, the scapulothoracic articulation. So the middle portion of your vertebral column or of your spine is called the thoracic section. And so each of these little vertebrae, which is a spine bone, each of these little vertebrae interacts with a rib, as you can see here. And so this thoracic section of the vertebral column includes all of your ribs. And so the scapulothoracic articulation just describes the interaction between the scapula and the thorax, which again is, is basically your rib cage and everything inside of your rib cage. So the scapulothoracic articulation is that interaction again between the scapula and the thorax. Now, in all of us, that's not a bone-to-bone -bone connection because as you'll see when we talk about next week, you've got a couple layers of muscle between those two structures. Um, so there's no bone-to-bone there's no -bone contact. It's not a true joint as we'll talk about, um, but essentially what's going to happen is that the scapula is going to slide. It's going to be pulled by muscles and it'll slide on the thorax or a slide on the rib cage.